Hi, this is Mike Hendrickson from AI Conference in San Francisco. I'm here with Peter Norvig. Peter, how are you doing? Doing great. Thanks, Mike. So you were on stage today talking with a young, um, up-and-coming AI master, basically, a young mm -hmm. kid that has done some incredible things. And you mentioned that AI, you're just getting started. What did you mean? Because you've been doing this for quite a while, and you're just getting started? Yeah. I, mean, I think we're, we're at the point now where it's possible for uh, a kid like Abu to do a great application uh, where you can say, let's look at some data, let's build a model, see what comes out of that, and get performance that solves an important task. And uh, we can do that now. It was much harder to do that five years ago. You know, then you thought of it more as, well, I got to build a big team, I got to go out, I got to uh, gather all the data, I need to have a lot of computing infrastructure to get it done. It was like you could only tackle the biggest of tasks with the highest of payoffs. Now you can do almost anything and there's more freely available data. Uh, everything is online now, data is being collected. Uh, so there's so much more opportunities and we're just starting to see what can we do with that. And some of it is uh, who's creative enough to say, here's a problem and a solution I can match up. Some of it is we need to invent new algorithms. Some of it is we need to uh, have the processing power continue to get stronger. And some of it is we need the sort of cultural institutions to say, we're going to share this and, and work together on it. So part of that cultural institutions um, is like the use of open source? Mm -hmm. Do you see that growing in the next few years? Because it seems like maybe it's not at the same maturity level as other areas. Uh, I definitely see uh, a move towards open source uh, within AI when, within, and within the whole computer science industry in general. Uh, I think we're seeing more of that. So uh, Abu talked about using open source in his... In right, his, uh, right. So he was able to get started with uh, open source data repositories and, and uh, I think that's really crucial to, to be able to get going. Uh, at Google we built TensorFlow to be open source from the ground up because uh, we had experience in the past where we would develop something internally and say now let's open source it and it turned out to be difficult. If it's locked into other components. It was, yeah, and, yeah, it's just messy to yeah. you know figure out, cut the cord and if there's one cord you can cut it but if there's a million it's hard to know where to cut it. So from the start, we said TensorFlow is going to be something that we are going to open source, and so it's much cleaner. And, and I think uh, other people are doing the same, seeing it as saying, you know, what's important is building a platform uh, that's going to go forward, and the platform better be open source. So in our new economy, I, I look at like there's two major phenomena with companies. It seems like there's the disruptors, the small innovative companies mm -hmm. that are using AI to disrupt industries. And then there's the transformers, mm -hmm. the large enterprises that are trying to use AI to transform their business so they don't get disrupted. Yeah. Who, who, who's going to win that battle? I mean, are they going to fight each other or how is that? Uh, how's that? I, I think everyone's going to win, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So to the extent that everyone's going to improve. And the uh, big companies can have an advantage in that they have access to data that, that others might not have, right? So there's plenty of open source data, but there's also data that by its very nature can't be open source. So uh, you health know, records. Health records, or, or even just any interaction with customers, you have to respect their privacy. And so if you've already got a billion customers, you have an advantage over somebody who doesn't. Uh, so I think uh, those types of forces w are in favor of the big companies. On the other hand, a big company can only do so many things. Uh, they can do more than one startup can do, but they can't do what a million startups can do. So out of those million startups, there's going to be a couple that are going to be really successful. And in those companies then can share their algorithms. Right. It doesn't have to be the data, but the algorithm right. to help train that billion record set or yeah. whatever. And you know, sometimes they succeed because of the algorithm, sometimes they succeed because of the data, and sometimes they succeed just because they saw a problem that nobody else had addressed yet. So if you could put on your, your far-reaching hat, where do you th think AI will be three years from now. I mean, we keep hearing autonomous vehicles. We keep hearing all this talk about what's going to happen. What do you think in the short term, which is actually quite long if you look at three years, yeah. 
But what, what do you see in that time frame happening that's going to be significantly better for everyone? I think that within three years we'll see more of this transition to a uh, assistance-based uh, interactions and operating systems, right? Where it looks like now we're, we're just starting to get into that, where uh, the industry's gone through various phases. You start with mainframes, you go to PCs, then you go to uh, phones, and now uh, we've Lots of people still have their phones, uh, but they also may have a, a speaker that they talk to. Or an IoT device. Or, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, and that works to some degree. I think it will uh, get better to the point where it really crosses the threshold to say this is really convenient to have a conversation rather than be poking at icons. And are we going to have to disentangle the technology from the cultural and political like organizational things that are going to happen because of sharing records of making things yeah. better in cities is that there's a point where you've crossed the continuum from cool to creepy yeah. and somewhere in there you know the unfortunate politics happen that's right so you know it's important for every company to be good uh, shepherds for the data that they have uh, but there's also an opportunity to say if we uh, can share this data we can learn uh, across multiple people and uh, I can learn from you and that will help me and, and vice versa. Uh, we got to figure out ways to do that in such a way that preserves your privacy but uh, it gives a societal benefit to everybody. And if you get that wrong, then it is creepy. Yeah, like CO2 emissions in the air it seems like it's good for everyone. I mean, no yeah. one's going to not benefit from that. but there's going to be wrangling over who does that and where. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's an interesting thing happening. So AI, what do you think the industry that is most going to use AI the best and quickest? Is it medical? Is it consumer? Is it? Uh, I think there's a lot of headroom for consumer. Of, uh, and I think we'll see uh, less of a clear boundary between what counts as AI and what doesn't, right? So we're already seeing that in terms of marketing. Of people always want to put the brand names of the hot new technology on whatever they do, uh, no matter how seriously they do it. Uh, so we'll see more AI and deep learning as a, a, a brand name. Uh, I think uh, sometimes it's not so much the technology itself as it is more of the mindset of, of moving from, uh, you know, sort of in, in traditional programming, the mindset is uh, an engineer sits down and writes out the steps step by step and then we're kind of stuck with that. And it's kind of this Boolean logic, it either does it or it doesn't. And with machine learning, it's more like, uh, well, the engineer is going to guide us but really it's the data that's going to make the decisions and it's going to be very fluid, it's going to change very rapidly and it's more probabilistic rather than Boolean. And so I think those mindset change is more important than the actual techniques. And if you can get to the point where you say we're doing experiments every day and we're trying to improve every day, uh, then that's the important thing. And whatever technology you use to implement that is less important than the mindset. So do you think the, the demo today, the Effecta, I think it was, yeah. the woman who talked about emotions in AI, mm -hmm. do you think that's an area that's needing to get more research done in? Because it seems like it's the harder harder nut to crack in this, this space. Yeah, so, uh, so I think that's great, and, and I think that's important, and we want to have uh, good conversations or dialogues with our systems. And uh, up to now, we've really force the, the user to do most of the work, right? You train the user, you got to press this button, you got to type this thing in, and you got to do it exactly the way the computer wants, and if you get one thing's wrong, it's your fault. Uh, I think we want to change that now and say, you know what, if you get it wrong, the fault is shared. And if there's a breakdown in communication, the system should be able to fix itself. And so some of that is having more fluid communication, modes, maybe I'm talking rather than typing or selecting icons, uh, and some of it is understanding what's going on at that deeper level, right? So uh, you should be able to know that I'm frustrated, and 
uh, the company you mentioned does that by uh, looking at your face and understanding your emotions. Uh, I think even the software we have today, you know, even if I didn't have a camera turned on, uh, you know, if I press the same button four times and, with, and with I get pressure, the same error yeah, message, yeah. it should know I'm frustrated and it shouldn't give me the same error message every single time. It should say, okay, I'll try something else. Yeah, and the same with the chatbots as well. Yeah. 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 So if you and I sat down next year at this time, Peter, what would you like to say has significantly changed in the market and specifically with Google and your AI work at Google? Uh, it's hard to predict, especially the future. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, one of the things we're really seeing is uh, uh, pushing on our uh, cloud platform to say we want to help more businesses uh, uh, take advantage of these technologies and take advantage of these APIs. I think we've done a pretty good job uh, providing tools that experts can use and we saw uh, this morning uh, uh, Abu taking good advantage of those tools. Uh, I think we've got a ways to go yet to say we want uh, everybody in every industry to be able to take advantage of this with, you know, without uh, getting themselves to the expert level. They should be able to say I want to plug in what you have into my existing workflow and make it better. A recommendation engine or whatever they're looking for. Right, right, right. 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 Excellent. We will look forward to that conversation next year. Okay, Thank see you, you then. All right.